Hey everyone and welcome back. Last time uh, we were talking about how AI and these large language models are really like shaking things up in the programming world. Yeah, it really feels like things are changing so fast. Right. Like remember that whole concept of prose code? Yeah. Describing what you want your program to do just like in plain English. It's wild. Yeah. Well, get ready because today's deep dive is taking that idea even further with some like brand new tools that have just come out. It is incredible how quickly things are moving. I mean, we're seeing a whole new wave of these AI powered tools and they're making development so much faster, yeah. more accessible, and I think even more intuitive. Absolutely. Yeah. And two of the most exciting examples we want to talk about today are uh, GitHub, Spark, and Bolt.new. Yeah, these are really taking the developer community by storm right now. They really are, and we're going to unpack why. Yeah, so I think it's really interesting to think back to our last conversation where we talked about how AI could make programming easier. Yeah. You know, even for people who don't have like a traditional coding background, tools like GitHub Copilot we talked about, those were some early examples of that. Right. But Spark takes that idea, I think, to a whole new level. Okay, so Spark is all about creating what they're calling micro apps or oh. Sparks. Can you break down exactly what that means for someone who's hearing this for the first time? Yeah. So imagine like you have this idea for a small personalized app. Okay. Maybe something to keep track of like your reading list hmm. or to visualize data from a spreadsheet you're working with. Uh -huh. Maybe even create like a simple game. Okay. But you don't actually know how to code. Right. With Spark, you don't have to. Yeah. You basically just like describe what you want your app to do. You use natural language, plain English, and Spark the AI behind it translates that into like a working application. So it really is like that cross code idea we talked about, but specifically for building these tiny little apps. Exactly. Okay. And what I think is really fascinating about it is that Spark breaks this process down into four like core components. The first one is what they call the natural language based editor. So this is where you're interacting with Spark, with the AI. Okay. And it's designed to feel like a conversation uh -huh. where you can describe your idea, you can ask questions and really refine your concept kind of iteratively as you go. That sounds pretty user friendly. Yeah. Okay. So once you've described what you want, what happens next? So then you get to the second component, which is the managed runtime environment. And this is what's so cool because it means you don't need to worry about all the technical stuff, oh, the wait. hosting, the deployment, or actually running your app. Spark just takes care of all that behind the scenes for you. So no setting up servers or any of that stuff. Exactly. It definitely makes things more accessible. Yeah. What about the design side of things? Yeah. So Spark's got you covered there too. Mm. The third component is what they call a themable design system. Okay. And this allows you to easily customize the look and feel of your app. You don't need to write any like CSS or HTML. That's really cool. So you can really make it look exactly how you want without needing to be like a design expert. Exactly. What's the fourth component? Okay. So the fourth component is persistent data storage and basically this means that your app can actually like save information okay and retrieve it later so like if you're building like a to-do list app you don't have to keep re-entering your tasks every time you use it it actually gets saved so it's not just like looks it can actually have some functionality right have you seen any cool examples of sparks that people have made oh yeah absolutely there's a ton of really cool examples already one that caught my eye was a mermaid diagram generator. Okay. So mermaid is a tool that lets you create diagrams and flowcharts using text, uh -huh. but learning the syntax for it can be kind of tricky. Right. This spark lets you generate those diagrams just by using simple like natural language prompts. Oh wow. Which is incredibly useful on platforms like GitHub that already support mermaid. That's a great example of how a spark can really like streamline stuff. Oh, yeah. And make these complex tools easier to use. Yeah. And make it accessible to more people. Yeah. It's not just about creating like little fun apps. It's about solving problems. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's tons of other cool examples too. People have created sparks for generating fake data to test other programs. There's like a hexagonal version of Minesweeper and even one for tracking karaoke night invitations. Uh, what? I know, right? It's kind of wild. That's so cool. So yeah. it really is living up to that accessible and even playful kind of development. Yeah. Now you mentioned that Spark is in technical preview. What does that mean for someone who's like, I want to try this now. Yeah. So it basically means Spark is still under development. Okay. But GitHub is actually really encouraging people to try it out and give them feedback. Okay. So if you're interested in getting early access, you can join the GitHub Next Discord server. Okay. They're sharing tons of examples and information there. Awesome. So GitHub is really embracing that open source 
kind of getting feedback, letting people play with it. Yeah. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about Bolt.new. Okay. How's that different from Spark? So while Spark is focused on creating those smaller self-contained micro apps, Bolt.new is for building like full stack web applications. Okay, so we're talking like more complex applications with like front end interfaces, back end logic, maybe even databases. Right. Okay, so it's stepping up the complexity, but it still uses this like natural language thing. Absolutely. Okay. It still aims to make development as intuitive as possible. And I think one of the really key things about Bolt.new is the speed. It's incredible how quickly users can go from having an idea to having a deployed web app. Wait, deployed? You mean like you can actually launch a working web app with this? Yes. Really? Bolt.new handles all the technical stuff of deploying your app so you can just focus on building what you want to build and making it look the way you want it to look. So you're telling me you can describe what you want yeah. in plain English, and Bolt.new will write the code, set up the servers, launch the app, all that. That's the power of it. It really does streamline the entire development process. And to give you an idea of how powerful this is, I was watching this French YouTube video, and this guy recreated this whole mobile app for finding on-call pharmacies. Wow. And this app, in the real world, it's valued at 4,500 euro. Okay. But he was able to rebuild it, the core functionality, using Bolt.new in like a fraction of the time and obviously for way less money. Wow. That's a pretty compelling example of what it can do. If you can recreate an app valued at thousands of euros using a tool like this, it really does raise some questions about the future of software development. Yeah. Who has access to it, all that. Yeah, for sure. And it's not just simple apps either. People are building e-commerce websites, image yeah. generation apps, even digital detox coaching platforms. That's pretty versatile then. Absolutely. It handles both front end and back end. You describe how you want the user interface to look and feel, what you want the app to actually do, and the AI just figures out all the code. And it even does things like server-side logic and database interactions, which are usually the more complicated parts of building web apps. That's really impressive. Can you walk me through like the actual user experience? What's it like to use it? Yeah, so you start by just typing in, in natural language, what you want to create. Okay. And as you're typing, bolt.neo starts generating the code in real time. Oh, wow. You can actually see it taking shape right in front of you. Okay. And then you can preview the app to see how it looks and how it works. On it. And if you're happy with it, you can deploy it with a single click. Wow, it sounds incredibly streamlined. You get to see the code as it's being generated. Yeah. Is that actually helpful for someone who's not a coding expert? So that's a really interesting question because some people say that that transparency is really important for building trust and understanding how the AI is working. Mm -hmm. But then other people wonder if it's really helpful for someone who doesn't really understand code anyway, or if it might actually be more overwhelming than insightful. That's a good point. Like it's giving you a peek behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know what you're looking at, it might not be that helpful. Right. All right. So let's take a step back and think about both Spark and Bolt.new in relation to that prose code concept that we were talking about in the last episode. Yeah, I think both of these tools really embody that prose code concept. Mm. They're all about translating those natural language descriptions into functional code. Mm -hmm. And I think what makes these tools so groundbreaking is this blurring of the line between what you want to do and what the machine actually executes. Right. They're shifting that focus away from like memorizing syntax, you know, different programming languages, and more toward just being able to explain clearly what you want and why you want it. It's almost like you're having a conversation with the computer. Yeah. Tell it what you want it to build. Yeah, it's a powerful concept. It is. So one key difference between Spark and Bolt.new huh. is in how they use these large language models, the LLMs. Right. We talked about those last time. Yeah. So those are the like the brains behind these tools. Right. The AI engines, they're trained on these massive amounts of data and can understand and generate human-like text. Exactly. So Spark right now can only use a single LLM provided by GitHub. Right. But Bolt.new lets you choose from different LLM providers. Right. So why is that a good thing? Well, it can be really useful because different LLMs might be better at different tasks. So with Bolt.new, you have more control over like which AI brain you're using for your project. Precisely. You have more options, more flexibility. Interesting. So both Spark and Bolt.new are pushing the boundaries of what's possible with AI-powered development. 
But I think it's important to talk about some of the concerns that we talked about last time, too. Yeah. This worry about AI replacing developers. Yeah, that's definitely a conversation that's happening a lot in the developer community. And I think it's understandable to have those concerns, but I think it's really important to remember that these tools, like Spark and Bolt.new, they're really more about augmenting what humans can do, not replacing them. So instead of seeing them as a threat, yeah. we should view them as like a partner in the development process. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Okay. They can handle some of those repetitive tasks, generate that basic code, give you suggestions. Right. And that frees up the human developer to focus on the more creative and complex stuff. It's almost like having a really smart assistant who can take care of the boring stuff. Yeah. So you can focus on the bigger picture thinking yeah the problem solved exactly okay and i think that this shift in focus might actually change what skills are most valuable for developers going forward so instead of needing to like memorize syntax and write every single line of code from scratch it might be more important to be able to communicate your ideas to the ai really clearly understand the broader concepts of software design and be able to evaluate and refine what the AI generates. So it's less about being a coding guru and more about being able to work with and guide these AI tools. Yeah, and it's almost like we're becoming more like architects. Okay. You know, designing the blueprint and letting the AI handle the actual construction. That's a great analogy. Yeah, and it raises a really fascinating question. What could this mean for the future of software development? If anyone can build software using these tools, what would that world look like? Yeah. That is the question, and one that we're going to keep exploring as we dive deeper into these tools. But for now, I want to turn it back over to you, our listener. I think what we're seeing is like this democratization of development. Yeah. You know, if anyone can build software with these tools, it could lead to like this explosion of creativity uh, and innovation. Yeah. Think about all the people who have these great ideas, but they just don't have the technical skills right. to make them a reality. Uh -huh. They can actually do it with tools like sparkandbolt.new. That's a really exciting thought. But as we talked about last time, there are some potential downsides too. Yeah. What about the concern that anyone could create like harmful software? That's a valid point. It's something that developers, platforms, policymakers, everyone needs to be thinking about. Right. Just like any powerful technology, you know, Uh huh. these no. tools could be used for good or bad. Right. The question is how to mitigate those risks without like squashing innovation. So how do we strike that balance? Is it about building safeguards into the platforms themselves? Yeah. Or more about educating users about the ethics of what they're creating? It's probably a combination of both. Yeah. I mean, platforms need to be proactive, implementing security measures, thinking about ethical guidelines. Right. But we also need to empower users to think critically about what they're building and the potential impact. It sounds like there's a lot of responsibility on everyone involved. Yeah. Do you think there's a risk that people might be so focused on all the cool things they can do uh -huh. that they forget about the potential downsides. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely possible. It's kind of like that classic sci-fi thing. Right. Humans creating something powerful without fully understanding what it could do, the harm it could cause. Right. We need to make sure we're not just blindly embracing this stuff without really thinking about the consequences. So it's not just about the tech itself. Right. It's about the human side of it the ethics, the responsibility. Absolutely. And it's not just about preventing bad software, it's also about things like jobs. Oh yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, what happens to the people whose jobs might be automated by these tools? Right, are we looking at a future where software developers are out of work or is it more complicated? I think it's definitely more complicated than that. While some jobs will likely be automated, I also think these tools will create new opportunities. Okay. We might see a shift towards jobs that are more about collaborating with AI, understanding how to use these tools, huh. and making sure that the code it generates is good, secure, and ethically sound. So instead of being replaced by AI, developers become more like AI orchestrators. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. Okay. And it could actually lead to a more creative and fulfilling job for them. Instead of getting bogged down and writing every little bit of code, they can focus on the big picture, solving the more interesting problems. So it's not about AI versus humans. It's about humans and AI working together. Exactly. And I think that's where the human element becomes even more important. We need developers who can think critically, communicate well, and really understand the ethics of what they're doing. So it's not just about technical skills anymore. It's about soft skills, critical thinking, ethics, 
Absolutely. And those skills are only going to be more valuable as AI plays a bigger role in development. You know, as you're talking about all of this, I keep thinking back to our conversation last time about how Pros code and tools like GitHub Copilot were already kind of changing things. It seems like Spark and Bolt.new are really taking that to the next level. They're definitely part of that same evolution. What's really exciting is that I think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible with AI and development. It does feel like we're on the edge of something big. But with any big change, there are always challenges that come along with it. Absolutely. And I think one of the most important questions is how do we prepare ourselves and especially future generations for this new world? That's a big one. What do we need to be teaching kids today to get them ready? Yeah. Do they still need to learn traditional programming languages or is that going to be a waste of time? It's a tough question and I don't think there's an easy answer. While traditional coding skills might still be useful, I think it's becoming more important to focus on a broader set of skills, critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration. So it's not just about writing code, but about thinking like a developer. Right. Approaching problems creatively and working well with AI. Exactly. We need to be encouraging kids to be adaptable, creative thinkers who can handle whatever changes come their way. That's a great point. Now I want to turn it back to you, our listener. Yeah. What are you thinking about as you're hearing all of this? Are you excited about the possibilities, Uh worried about the downsides, Yeah, maybe a little bit of both. I'd love to hear what you think. What stands out to you as the most exciting opportunities or the biggest challenges with these tools? Yeah, keep in mind, this isn't just some abstract tech trend. This is stuff that could change all of our lives, so your thoughts really matter. One of the things that really struck me as we were prepping for this deep dive was just how fast these tools are changing. Yeah, it's like every week there's some new breakthrough. It's incredible. It's almost like watching a time lapse of a plant growing. But instead of a plant, it's this powerful AI that's learning to code better and faster every single day. Yeah. And that speed is both exciting and kind of scary. I know. On one hand, we're constantly pushing the limits of what's possible. Yeah. But it also means we need to be really adaptable and always willing to learn new things. What's in demand today might be outdated tomorrow. That's why it's so important to focus on those core skills. Critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration. Exactly, because those are the skills that will help us navigate any kind of technological change. It's not about mastering one specific tool or technology. It's about having that mindset of always learning and adapting. And it's about remembering that technology is a tool. It's up to us as humans to decide how we use it, what we build with it, and what kind of future we want. Which brings us back to that human element. That's been a theme throughout this whole conversation. Even though these tools are so powerful, it's still humans who are driving the innovation, making the decisions, shaping the future. And that's why it's so important to talk about ethics, responsibility, and the impact on people. Yeah, we need to make sure we're using these tools to make the world better, not just more technologically advanced. Right. And one of the key themes that's come up with Spark and Bolt.new is this shift from focusing on syntax to focusing on concepts. Yeah. Remember how we were saying these tools are blurring the lines between what we want and what the machine does? Exactly. It's becoming less about knowing specific code and more about being able to explain what you want to create and why. It's about understanding the big picture, how software is designed, the user experience, problem solving. It's about thinking like an architect. You know, Hmm. designing the blueprints and letting the AI do the building. I love that metaphor. It really captures what's happening. Yeah. And I think this shift has implications for everyone, not just developers. As these tools become more common, we all need to understand how they work and how to communicate with them. It's like learning a new language, the language of AI. Yeah. And the better we understand it, the more we can use it to do cool stuff, solve problems. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the impact on jobs. We already mentioned there are concerns about some jobs being automated. Right. But there's also a lot of excitement about the potential for these tools to create new opportunities for people who maybe didn't have a way into tech before. Like we were saying last time, AI could make coding more accessible to people who don't have that traditional computer science background. Could Spark and Bolt.new actually make the tech industry more inclusive? They definitely have the potential to do that. If anyone can build software, it could open up a whole world of possibilities. We might see more entrepreneurship, more innovation, more creativity coming from people in places we wouldn't expect. It's like we're saying, hey, you have a good idea. You can build an app now. 
Exactly. And that's super exciting. But it also means we need to think about how we prepare people for these new opportunities. We need to make sure everyone has access to the education and resources they need to succeed. So it's not enough to just build the tools. We have to build the support system around them. Exactly. And we have to make sure that everyone benefits from this technology, not just a small group of people. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the good stuff, but I think it's important to be realistic. There are challenges and risks too. Absolutely. We've mentioned some of them already, like people using these tools for bad purposes and the potential for job losses. But there are also bigger societal implications we need to think about. Like what? Well, one concern is that these tools could actually make existing inequalities worse. Okay. If only certain people have access to them or the education to use them, it could widen the gap between those who have and those who don't. So it's not just about making the tech available. It's about making it accessible and fair for everyone. Exactly. We need to be thinking about digital literacy, affordability, and just making sure everyone can get on board. That makes sense. Are there other things we should be considering? Another concern is privacy and security. As these tools get more powerful, we need to be really careful about protecting people's data and making sure their information isn't misused. That's a big one. And it seems like every time we make a tech advancement, we have new privacy and security worries to deal with. It's true. It's like a constant back and forth. Yeah. But it's one we can't afford to ignore. The stakes are too high when it comes to our personal data. Right. So it sounds like there's a lot to be excited about, but also a lot to be cautious about as we move forward with these AI tools. Yeah, it's a complicated situation, but I think it's worth exploring. And that's what we're doing here. We're not just looking at the technical side, but also the ethical side, the impact on society and the human element. Right, because it's not just about the tech itself, it's about how we use it and what kind of world we create. Now, before we wrap up this part, I wanna remind everyone that this is all happening really fast. Yeah. What we're discussing today could be old news tomorrow. That's how it is with technology. Yeah. It's always changing and there's always something new to learn. So stay curious, keep asking questions, and be open to new ideas. That's the key. Yeah. Embrace the unknown, and remember, we create the future together. And that brings up another question. What will developers do in this future where AI is creating software? A lot of developers are asking that question, and I don't think there's one right answer. But it's clear that the role of the developer is going to change. So you don't think developers will just disappear? I don't think so. In fact, we might need even more developers. But what they do might be different. So instead of being code experts, they might be more like AI guides, able to talk to these systems and get them to create good code. Yeah, I like that. And it can make their jobs even more interesting. They can spend less time fixing bugs and more time coming up with creative solutions, designing better user experiences, and solving the really hard problems that need human brains. So we're not getting rid of developers, we're making their jobs better. Exactly. And it's important to remember that AI can automate certain tasks, but it can't replace the things that make us human, the things that make great software. Like creativity, understanding other people, intuition, being able to anticipate what users need. Exactly. Those are the things that set us apart from AI. And those are the things that will determine whether a software project succeeds or fails. Now, one challenge as we move into this world of AI-powered development is making sure that these tools are used responsibly and ethically. That's come up a few times today. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to just build cool tools. We have to make sure they're used for good. Right. It's about making sure our tech aligns with our values as humans. And that's everyone's responsibility, not just developers, but also policymakers, educators, all of us. We need to be talking openly and honestly about the ethics of AI setting clear rules, and holding each other accountable for the impact of what we build. It's about creating a future where tech helps us, not the other way around. Exactly. And remembering that tech is just a tool. It can be used for good or bad, and it's up to us to decide what kind of world we create with it. So as we wrap up this part, I want you, our listener, to think about your role in all of this. How do you think these AI tools will affect your life, your work, the world around you? What excites you? What worries you? And how can you be a part of shaping this future in a positive way? Those are some big questions and no easy answers, but they're important to think about. We want to hear what you think. Okay, so as we wrap up this deep dive, I want to go back to something we talked about earlier, that whole idea of AI replacing developers. Yeah, it's something a lot of people are worried about. It is. But what if we looked at it differently? Okay. What if instead of being scared of AI, we thought of it as like a teammate? So instead of competition, it's more like a collaboration. 
Exactly. Yeah. We've talked about this a bit, but it's worth repeating. These tools could free us from doing all that boring, repetitive coding work. Right. And let us focus on the stuff humans are good at, like creative problem solving, making things easy to use, building software that actually helps people. Yeah. It's about combining the strengths of humans and AI to make something better than either one could do alone. Right. And this actually connects back to something we discussed in the last episode, too. Do you remember how we talked about Prose Code and tools like GitHub Copilot starting to blend what we want to do with what the machine actually does? Yeah, definitely. And it seems like Spark and Bolt.new are taking that even further. They're basically making coding more like a conversation, a back and forth between humans and machines. It's like having a super smart helper who gets your ideas and helps you make them real. Yeah. And this change in how we think about coding could have huge effects. For example, it could make software development open to way more people. Right. If you don't need to learn all that complicated code to build something. Exactly. It removes a big obstacle for people who want to create. And that brings us back to what we were discussing earlier about how these tools could make development more accessible to anyone. Imagine everyone who has a good idea being able to build an app or website. That's the potential here. It's about giving people the power to create, to come up with new things, and to solve problems in ways they couldn't before. But like we've said before, with great power comes great responsibility. Exactly. We have to use these tools in a good way. So all those discussions we've been having about ethics and responsibility and remembering the human side of things are really important. Absolutely. We need to think about the possible downsides, how to reduce risks, and how to make sure this tech is used to make things better. This is a responsibility we all share. Okay, so one last thought I want to leave everyone with is this. Don't be afraid to try things out. We talked about Spark and Bolt.new, but there are so many other AI-powered development tools out there, and new ones are popping up all the time. That's what's so exciting about this. It's always changing, and there's always something new to learn. So be curious. Play around with these tools. See what you can make. Don't be afraid to experiment. And most importantly, have fun. Coding should be enjoyable. It's about being creative, solving problems, and turning your ideas into reality. Yeah, and as we move into this new era of AI-powered development, I think that sense of fun and exploration is going to be more important than ever. So go out there, try new things, build cool stuff. Let's see what we can create together. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. We'll be back soon with another episode exploring the latest and greatest in AI and what it all means for the future. 